A subdued tone of conversation and the absence of cigar smoke and boot heels at the windows of the Wingdam stagecoach made it evident that one of the inside passengers was a woman. A disposition on the part of the loungers at the stations to congregate before the window, and some concern in regard to the appearance of coats, hats, and collars further indicated that she was lovely all of which Mr. Jack Hamlin, on the box seat, noted with the smile of cynical philosophy. Not that he depreciated the sex, but that he recognized therein a deceitful element, the pursuit of which sometimes drew mankind away from the equally uncertain blandishments of poker, of which it may be remarked that Mr. Hamlin was a professional exponent so that when he placed his narrow boot on the wheel and leaped down, he did not even glance at the window from which a green veil was fluttering, but lounged up and down with that listless and grave indifference of his class, which was, perhaps, the next thing to good breeding. With his closely buttoned figure and self-contained air, he was a marked contrast to the other passengers, with their feverish restlessness and boisterous emotion and even Bill Masters, a graduate of Harvard, with his slovenly dress, his overflowing vitality, his intense appreciation of lawlessness and barbarism, and his mouth filled with crackers and cheese, I fear cut but an unromantic figure beside this lonely calculator of chances, with his pale Greek face and Homeric gravity. The driver called, All aboard! and Mr. Hamlin returned to the coach. His foot was upon the wheel, and his face raised to the level of the open window, when, at the same moment, what appeared to him to be the finest eyes in the world suddenly met his. He quietly dropped down again, addressed a few words to one of the inside passengers, effected an exchange of seats, and as quietly took his place inside. Mr. Hamlin never allowed his philosophy to interfere with decisive and prompt action. I fear that this eruption of Jack cast some restraint upon the other passengers, particularly those who were making themselves most agreeable to the lady. One of them leaned forward, and apparently conveyed to her information regarding Mr. Hamlin's profession in a single epithet. Whether Mr. Hamlin heard it, or whether he recognized in the informant a distinguished jurist from whom, but a few evenings before, he had won several thousand dollars, I cannot say. His colorless face betrayed no sign. His black eyes, quietly observant, glanced indifferently past the legal gentleman, and rested on the much more pleasing features of his neighbor. An Indian stoicism, said to be an inheritance from his maternal ancestor, stood him in good service until the rolling wheels rattled upon the river gravel at Scott's Ferry, and the stage drew up at the International Hotel for dinner. The legal gentleman and a member of Congress leaped out, and stood ready to assist the descending goddess, while Colonel Starbottle of Siskiyou took charge of her parasol and shawl. In this multiplicity of attention there was a momentary confusion and delay. Jack Hamlin quietly opened the opposite door of the coach, took the lady's hand, with that decision and positiveness which a hesitating and undecided sex know how to admire, and in an instant had dexterously and gracefully swung her to the ground, and again lifted her to the platform. An audible chuckle on the box, I fear, came from that other cynic, Yuba Bill, the driver. "'Look carefully arter that baggage, Colonel,' said the expressman, with affected concern, as he looked after Colonel Starbottle, gloomily bringing up the rear of the triumphant procession to the waiting-room. Mr. Hamlin did not stay for dinner. His horse was already saddled and waiting him. He dashed over the ford, up the gravelly hill, and out into the dusty perspective of the Wingdam Road, like one leaving pleasant fancy behind him. The inmates of dusty cabins by the roadside shaded their eyes with their hands and looked after him, recognizing the man by his horse and speculating what was up with Comanche Jack. Yet, much of this interest centered in the horse, in a community where the time made by French Pete's mare in his run from the sheriff of Calaveras County eclipsed all concern in the ultimate fate of that worthy. The sweating flanks of his gray at length recalled him to himself. He checked his speed, and, turning into a by-road, sometimes used as a cut-off, trotted leisurely along, 
the reins hanging listlessly from his fingers. As he rode on, the character of the landscape changed and became more pastoral. Openings in groves of pine and sycamore disclosed some rude attempts at cultivation. A flowering vine trailed over the porch of one cabin, and a woman rocked her cradled babe under the roses of another. A little farther on, Mr. Hamlin came upon some bare-legged children wading in the willowy creek, and so wrought upon them with a badinage peculiar to himself that they were emboldened to climb up his horse's legs and over his saddle, until he was fain to develop an exaggerated ferocity of demeanor and to escape, leaving behind some kisses and coin. And then, advancing deeper into the woods where all signs of habitation failed, he began to sing, uplifting a tenor so singularly sweet, and shaded by a pathos so subduing and tender, that I wot the robins and linnets stopped to listen. Mr. Hamlin's voice was not cultivated. The subject of his song was some sentimental lunacy borrowed from the negro minstrels, but there thrilled through all some occult quality of tone and expression that was unspeakably touching. Indeed, it was a wonderful sight to see this sentimental blackleg, with a pack of cards in his pocket and a revolver at his back, sending his voice before him through the dim woods with a pliant about his Nellie's grave, in a way that overflowed the eyes of the listener. A sparrowhawk, fresh from his sixth victim, possibly recognizing in Mr. Hamlin a kindred spirit, stared at him in surprise, and was fain to confess the superiority of man. With a superior predatory capacity, he couldn't sing. But Mr. Hamlin presently found himself again on the high road and at his former pace. Ditches and banks of gravel, denuded hillsides, stumps and decayed trunks of trees took the place of woodland and ravine, and indicated his approach to civilization. Then a church steeple came in sight, and he knew that he had reached home. In a few moments he was clattering down the single narrow street that lost itself in a chaotic ruin of races, ditches, and tailings at the foot of the hill, and dismounted before the gilded windows of the Magnolia Saloon. Passing through the long bar-room he pushed open a green baize door, entered a dark passage, opened another door with a pass-key, and found himself in a dimly lighted room whose furniture, though elegant and costly for the locality, showed signs of abuse. The inlaid center table was overlaid with stained discs that were not contemplated in the original design. The embroidered armchairs were discolored, and the green velvet lounge on which Mr. Hamlin threw himself was soiled at the foot with the red soil of Wingdam. Mr. Hamlin did not sing in his cage. He lay still, looking at a highly colored painting above him representing a young creature of opulent charms. It occurred to him then, for the first time, that he had never seen exactly that kind of woman, and that if he should, he would not probably fall in love with her. Perhaps he was thinking of another style of beauty, but just then someone knocked at the door. Without rising, he pulled the cord that apparently shot back a bolt, for the door swung open and a man entered. The newcomer was broad-shouldered and robust, a vigor not borne out in the face, which, though handsome, was singularly weak and disfigured by dissipation. He appeared to be also under the influence of liquor, for he started on seeing Mr. Hamlin and said, I thought Kate was here, stammered and seemed confused and embarrassed. Mr. Hamlin smiled the smile which he had before worn on the Wingdam coach and sat up, quite refreshed and ready for business. "'You didn't come up on the stage,' continued the newcomer, "'did you?' "'No,' replied Hamlin. "'I left it at Scott's Ferry. "'It isn't due for half an hour yet. "'But how's luck, Brown?' "'Damn bad,' said Brown, "'his face suddenly assuming an expression of weak despair. "'I'm cleaned out again, Jack,' he continued, "'in a whining tone that formed a pitiable contrast "'to his bulky figure. "'Can't you help me with a hundred till tomorrow's clean-up?' You see, I've got to send money home to the old woman, and you've won twenty times that amount from me. The conclusion was perhaps not entirely logical, but Jack overlooked it and handed the sum to his visitor. The old woman business is about played out, Brown, he added by way of commentary. Why don't you say you want to buck again Pharaoh? You know you ain't married. Fact, sir, said Brown, with a sudden gravity, as if the mere contact of the gold with the palm of the hand had imparted some dignity to his frame. I've got a wife, a damn good one, too, if I do say it, in the States. 
It's three years since I've seen her, and a year since I've writ to her. When things is about straight, and we get down to the lead, I'm going to send for her. And Kate? queried Mr. Hamlin, with his previous smile. Mr. Brown of Calaveras essayed an archness of glance to cover his confusion, which his weak face and whiskey-muddled intellect but poorly carried out, and said, "'Damn it, Jack, a man must have a little liberty, you know. But come, what do you say to a little game? Give us a show to double this hundred. Jack Hamlin looked curiously at his fatuous friend. Perhaps he knew that the man was predestined to lose the money, and preferred that it should flow back into his own coffers rather than any other. He nodded his head, and drew his chair toward the table. At the same moment there came a rap on the door. "'It's Kate,' said Mr. Brown. Mr. Hamlin shot back the bolt, and the door opened. But for the first time in his life he staggered to his feet, utterly unnerved and abashed, and for the first time in his life the hot blood crimsoned his colorless cheeks to his forehead. For before him stood the lady he had lifted from the wingdam coach, whom Brown, dropping his cards with a hysterical laugh, greeted as, "'My old woman, by thunder!' They say that Mrs. Brown burst into tears and reproaches of her husband. I saw her in 1857 at Marysville and disbelieved the story. And the Wingdam Chronicle of the next week, under the head of Touching Reunion, said, One of those beautiful and touching incidents peculiar to California life occurred last week in our city. The wife of one of Wingdam's eminent pioneers, tired of the effete civilization of the East and its inhospitable climate, resolved to join her noble husband upon these golden shores. Without informing him of her intention, she undertook the long journey and arrived last week. The joy of the husband may be easier imagined than described. The meeting is said to have been indescribably affecting. We trust her example may be followed. Whether owing to Mrs. Brown's influence or to some more successful speculations, Mr. Brown's financial fortune from that day steadily improved. He bought out his partners in the nip-and-tuck lead with money which was said to have been won at poker a week or two after his wife's arrival, but which rumor, adopting Mrs. Brown's theory that Brown had forsworn the gambling table, declared to have been furnished by Mr. Jack Hamlin. He built and furnished the Wingdam house, which pretty Mrs. Brown's great popularity kept overflowing with guests. He was elected to the assembly, and gave largesse to churches. A street in Wingdam was named in his honor. Yet it was noted that in proportion as he waxed wealthy and fortunate, he grew pale, thin, and anxious. As his wife's popularity increased, he became fretful and impatient. The most uxorious of husbands, he was absurdly jealous. If he did not interfere with his wife's social liberty, it was because it was maliciously whispered that his first and only attempt was met by an outburst from Mrs. Brown that terrified him into silence. Much of this kind of gossip came from those of her own sex whom she had supplanted in the chivalrous attentions of Wingdam, which, like most popular chivalry, was devoted to an admiration of power, whether of masculine force or feminine beauty. It should be remembered, too, in her extenuation that since her arrival she had been the unconscious priestess of a mythological worship, perhaps not more ennobling to her womanhood than that which distinguished an older Greek democracy. I think that Brown was dimly conscious of this, but his only confidant was Jack Hamlin, whose infelix reputation naturally precluded any open intimacy with the family, and whose visits were infrequent. It was midsummer and a moonlit night, and Mrs. Brown, very rosy, large-eyed, and pretty, sat upon the piazza, enjoying the fresh incense of the mountain breeze, and, it is to be feared, another incense which is not so fresh, nor quite as innocent. Beside her sat Colonel Starbottle and Judge Boompointer, and a later addition to her court in the shape of a foreign tourist. She was in good spirits. "'What do you see down the road?' inquired the gallant Colonel, who had been conscious for the last few minutes that Mrs. Brown's attention was diverted. "'Dust,' said Mrs. Brown, with a sigh. "'Only Sister Anne's flock of sheep.' The colonel, whose literary recollections did not extend farther back than last week's paper, took a more practical view. "'It ain't sheep,' he continued. "'It's a horseman. Judge, ain't that Jack Hamlin's gray?' But the judge didn't know, and as Mrs. Brown suggested the air was growing too cold for further investigations, they retired to the parlor. 
Mr. Brown was in the stable, where he generally retired after dinner. Perhaps it was to show his contempt for his wife's companions. Perhaps, like other weak natures, he found pleasure in the exercise of absolute power over inferior animals. He had a certain gratification in the training of a chestnut mare, whom he could beat or caress as pleased him, which he couldn't do with Mrs. Brown. It was here that he recognized a certain gray horse which had just come in, and, looking a little farther on, found its rider. Brown's greeting was cordial and hearty, Mr. Hamlin's somewhat restrained, but at Brown's urgent request he followed him up the back stairs to a narrow corridor and thence to a small room looking out upon the stable-yard. It was plainly furnished with a bed, a table, a few chairs, and a rack for guns and whips. "'This year's my home, Jack,' said Brown, with a sigh, as he threw himself upon the bed and motioned his companion to a chair. "'Her room's t'other end of the hall. It's more than six months since we've lived together, or met, except at meals. It's mighty rough papers on the head of the house, ain't it?' he said with a forced laugh. "'But I'm glad to see you, Jack, damn glad.' And he reached from the bed, and again shook the unresponsive hand of Jack Hamlin. I brought ye up here, for I didn't want to talk in the stable, though, for the matter of that, it's all round town. Don't strike a light. We can talk here in the moonshine. Put up your feet on that winder, and sit here beside me. There's whiskey in that jug. Mr. Hamlin did not avail himself of the information. Brown of Calaveras turned his face to the wall and continued. If I didn't love the woman, Jack, I wouldn't mind. But it's loving her and seeing her day arter day going on at this rate and no one to put down the break. That's what gets me. But I'm glad to see you, Jack, damn glad. In the darkness he groped about until he had found and wrung his companion's hand again. He would have detained it, but Jack slipped it into the buttoned breast of his coat and asked listlessly, How long has this been going on? Ever since she came here, ever since the day she walked into the magnolia, I was a fool then. Jack, I'm a fool now, but I didn't know how much I loved her till then, and she hasn't been the same woman since. But that ain't all, Jack, and it's what I wanted to see you about, and I'm glad you've come. It ain't that she doesn't love me any more. It ain't that she fools with every chap that comes along, for, perhaps, I staked her love and lost it, as I did everything else at the Magnolia, and perhaps foolin' is natural to some women, and there ain't no great harm done, except to the fools. But, Jack, I think... I think she loves somebody else. Don't move, Jack. Don't move. If your pistol hurts, she take it off. It's been more than six months now that she's seemed unhappy and lonesome and kinder nervous and scared-like, and sometimes I've catched her looking at me sort of timid and pitying, and she writes to somebody, and for the last week she's been gathering her own things, trinkets and furbelows and jewelry, and, and Jack, I think she's going off. I could stand all but that. To have her steal away like a thief... He put his face downward to the pillow, and for a few moments there was no sound but the ticking of a clock on the mantel. Mr. Hamlin lit a cigar and moved to the open window. The moon no longer shone into the room, and the bed and its occupant were in the shadow. "'What shall I do, Jack?' said the voice from the darkness. The answer came promptly and clearly from the window side. "'Spot the man and kill him on sight.' "'But Jack!' "'He's took the risk.' "'But will that bring her back?' Jack did not reply, but moved from the window toward the door. "'Don't go yet, Jack. Light the candle and sit by the table. It's a comfort to see you, if nothing else.' Jack hesitated, then complied. He drew a pack of cards from his pocket and shuffled them, glancing at the bed. But Brown's face was turned to the wall. When Mr. Hamlin had shuffled the cards, he cut them and dealt one card on the opposite side of the table and toward the bed, and another on his side of the table for himself. The first was a deuce, his own card a king. Then he shuffled and cut again. This time, Dummy had a queen, and himself a four-spot. Jack brightened up for the third deal. It brought his adversary a deuce, and himself a king again. Two out of three, said Jack audibly. What's that, Jack? said Brown. Nothing. Then Jack tried his hand with dice, but he always threw sixes, and his imaginary opponent aces. The force of habit is sometimes confusing. Meanwhile, some magnetic influence in Mr. Hamlin's presence, or the anodyne of liquor, or both, brought surcease of sorrow, and Brown slept. Mr. Hamlin moved his chair to the window, and looked out on the town of Wingdam, now sleeping peacefully, its harsh outlines softened and subdued 
its glaring colors mellowed and sobered in the moonlight that flowed over all. In the hush he could hear the gurgling of water in the ditches and the sighing of the pines beyond the hill. Then he looked up at the firmament, and as he did so a star shot across the twinkling field. Presently another, and then another. The phenomenon suggested to Mr. Hamlin a fresh augury. If in another fifteen minutes another star should fall, he sat there and watched in hand for twice that time, but the phenomenon was not repeated. The clock struck two, and Brown still slept. Mr. Hamlin approached the table and took from his pocket a letter, which he read by the flickering candlelight. It contained only a single line written in pencil in a woman's hand. Be at the corral with the buggy at three. The sleeper moved uneasily and then awoke. Are you there, Jack? Yes. Don't go yet. I dreamed just now, Jack, dreamed of old times. I thought that Sue and me was being married again, and that the parson, Jack, was, who do you think? You! The gambler laughed and seated himself on the bed, the paper still in his hand. That's a good sign, ain't it? queried Brown. I reckon. Say, old man, hadn't you better get up? The old man, thus affectionately appealed to, rose with the assistance of Hamlin's outstretched hand. Smoke? Brown mechanically took the proffered cigar. Light? Jack had twisted the letter into a spiral, lit it, and held it for his companion. He continued to hold it until it was consumed and dropped the fragment, a fiery star, from the open window. He watched it as it fell and returned to his friend. "'Old man,' he said, placing his hands on Brown's shoulders, "'in ten minutes I'll be on the road and gone like that spark. We won't see each other again, but before I go, take a fool's advice, sell out all you've got, Take your wife with you and quit the country. It ain't no place for you nor her. Tell her she must go. Make her go if she won't. Don't whine because you can't be a saint and she ain't an angel. Be a man and treat her like a woman. Don't be a damn fool. Goodbye. He tore himself from Brown's grasp and leaped down the stairs like a deer. At the stable door he collared the half-sleeping hostler and backed him against the wall. Saddle my horse in two minutes, or I'll... The ellipsis was frightfully suggestive. The missus said you was to have the buggy, stammered the man. Damn the buggy. The horse was saddled as fast as the nervous hands of the astounded hostler could manipulate buckle and strap. Is anything up, Mr. Hamlin, said the man, who, like all his class, admired the elan of his fiery patron and was really concerned in his welfare. Stand aside. The man fell back. With an oath, a bound, and a clatter, Jack was into the road. In another moment, to the man's half-awakened eyes, he was but a moving cloud of dust in the distance, toward which a star just loosed from its brethren was trailing a stream of fire. But early that morning, the dwellers by the wing dam turnpike, miles away, heard a voice, pure as a skylark, singing a field. They who were asleep turned over on their rude couches to dream of youth and love and olden days. Hard-faced men and anxious gold-seekers, already at work, ceased their labors and leaned upon their picks, to listen to a romantic vagabond ambling away against the rosy sunrise. End 